So I will welcome, if I may, back to the Anglo-Swedish Society, Professor Claire Thompson. Uh, I'm jumping the gun by a week or two, but I don't think you'll worry too much about that. Uh, Claire gave us a fascinating talk last year on the major silent film, Schürkarlen, uh, the driver, or usually in English, the phantom carriage. Claire is director of film studies at UCL and was recently appointed professor of cinema history. She is a specialist in Nordic, particularly Danish cinema, that teaches film history and theory more generally for UCL's MA course in film studies. Uh, I will share with you some of her major publications, but if I can apologize in advance to anybody, particularly the Danes, whose names I sadly mispronounce. So uh, with that in mind, Claire's major publications include uh, Thomas Winterberg's Festen, published in 2013, Bart Dorm, Femog Fems, or in English, Dogma 95 in the digital term, and the short films from the small nation, Danish informational cinema, uh, 1935 to 65, published in 2018. Uh, edited anthologies, Northern Constellations, New Readings in Nordic Cinema, published in 2006, a history of Danish cinema published with Dr. Isaac Thorsen and Professor P. Shi Shao, which is going to be published later this year. Claire is currently collaborating with two Swedish film scholars, Dr. Frederik Noren and Professor Emil Schienholm on a book project coming out next year, Nordic Media Histories of Propaganda and Persuasion. This evening, Claire is moving us from the pre-First World War times of Selma Lagerlöf to post-World War Sweden, a country that in that time had changed very much less than most other European countries, but where change was about to come fast. Sweden was coming to terms with the end of the war when it had tried, but perhaps not too successfully, to maintain strict neutrality. Its strategic importance geographically its closeness to Finland, an ally of Germany in the war against the Soviet Union, and above all, its iron ore deposits added to the pressures on the nation. It was a country paying reparations, though the word was taboo, a country transi transitioning from a rural agrarian society to an industrialized and increasingly urban society. But perhaps most importantly, it was suffering from a low birth rate so it was in the early stages of encouraging immigration and so changing from a largely homogeneous society to a multi-ethnic society where a large number of its population spoke very little of any Swedish at all. This is the background against which the short films that Claire will talk to us about this evening were produced. Claire, if I can pass over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Robert, and thanks to, to all of you for, uh, well, for an invitation back again and, and a warm welcome, and also for that um, little potted history of uh, post-Second World War Sweden, which I think is a really useful springboard for us, um, because I, I'm not really going to go through the history, I'm just going to dive straight into the films. If you were at the Lagerlöf talk, um, I can't even remember when that was, was it last autumn? I think it was last autumn. Um, th that that of course was 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 a, a classic film, a canonical film, a very a very sweet film. Um, the films that I'll be talking about today are are really anything but. <laughs> they are arguably not classic. They are often difficult to understand. Uh, they 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 don't have canonical status. They're not even feature films. Um, and this is strangely enough um, my my favourite area of of research, roughly speaking, the period from the mid 1930s through to the mid 1960s. And um, I can explain why it finishes in the early to mid 1960s. Um, and I'm sure you can guess that's when when television becomes widespread. And so people are getting their their information and their entertainment in their living rooms. But for the two or three decades before that, internationally, People tended to get their information from short films, um, often narrow gauge films, 
which were exchanged internationally using using libraries, using portable projectors. Um, and they were screened in cinemas, but they were also screened in places like church halls and cafes and nightclubs and every every imaginable place. So this is a very kind of different cinema culture. It's almost a, a, a shadow cinema culture. Um, that's how it's sometimes described. And I'll be really interested uh, at the end to hear if any of you have any memories of um, of, of this kind of uh, film culture, this informational film culture, as I like to call it. If you hear a gentle snoring noise, it's just my cat. Um, I'm afraid he's fallen asleep, but at least he's not having a bath on the couch behind us, which has occasionally happened when teaching. So I will um, I'll share my screen. Uh, the other little warning I should give you is that um, because these films were made when they were in the mid 20th century, the sound quality is often not very good for two reasons. One, because the, the technology just wasn't there, especially when filmmakers were, were out and about. So the, the sound is often quite crackly or poor quality to start with. And then, of course, more than half a century later, um, the sound has often disintegrated before it could be digitised. So if the sound doesn't sound too clear, that's why it's it's not that there's a, a technological problem. Um, okay, let's share the screen. So could I get a thumbs up from uh, Robert if you can see a slide saying secrets.com? I can indeed. Excellent. Thank you. Just making sure. Um, and this is a still, uh, in, indeed, uh, from one of the, the films um, about mid-century Stockholm that I'll be talking about later on. I really like the juxtaposition here of the uh, the old traditional wooden house and, and uh, the block of, of flats that seems to sum up the kind of transition period that Robert was just talking about. I thought I would start um, by diving straight into probably the most famous and, and successful uh, Swedish informational film or city symphony film, um, as we might want to call it later on. Some of you might well have, have seen this film or parts of it already. And uh, it's called Menesor i Stad. The English title was always Rhythm of a City. And I'm just going to show um, a few minutes of this so that you can get a sense of, of how it looks, how it sounds and, and what it does. So this is the first um, few minutes of uh, a 17 minute film. And you can see that it was digitally restored by the Swedish Film Institute just a few years ago. And it dates from 1947. <laughs> Thank you. 
on that hand by the traffic policeman seems as, as good a place as any to, to stop. You can see right away that in, in the first few moments we've got a, a pretty traditional you know, series of establishing shots of, of the city. They're quite poetic. Uh, it's interested in the aerial view, the bird, literally the, the bird's eye view. Um, and then, of course, we, we come downwards um, onto the streets themselves and we start to see these, these very um, abstract patterns. So we can see that there are people and cars and cobblestones, um, but the, the city is, is being rendered really quite uh, abstract. And you'll also have noticed, even though the, the sound quality is quite poor, that, of course, both, both music is, is crucial and, and the environmental sounds are, are crucial as well. So this is very much a, a soundscape. Um, it's a, a, a Stockholm that speaks and, and sings to us. And um, often this kind of film, I'll come back to this later, was called a city symphony. And, and the symphony is meant both quite literally, um, but also metaphorically. And the various parts of the city are, are, are coming together, playing together, being conducted rhythmically. Um, I would I would highly recommend watching um, the whole of uh, Rhythm of, of a City, and you can easily find it on YouTube um, and there are there are a few different versions um, and often it comes in uh, two or three reels as well. So here is the, the filmmaker Arne Stuxdorf looking pretty pleased with himself on the left there in his bow tie because he's just won an Oscar. And it might seem a little bit odd that um, one could win an Oscar for uh, a, a short informational film but in fact this kind of filmmaking was so important mid-century that uh, there was a, an Oscar category called um, Best Short Subject. The category changed its name a few times over the years. Um, but uh, this was Sweden's first Oscar. Um, you've, had, you've had a few since then, another half dozen, I think, but Arne Sukstorff got there first for this very particular kind of, of filmmaking. Um, so I've started with uh, Rhythm of a City because we, we will keep coming back to it. Um, in my research over the last few years, even though I've tended to focus on, on the Danish context, Arne Sorgsdorf keeps popping up. Um, it's amazing how often he, uh, he rears his, his head um, in the, the kind of entangled history of this kind of filmmaking in Scandinavia. Um, now, I won't show this just now, but we might come back to it at the end. I'm sure that a lot of you will be Ingmar Bergman fans, or if not fans, will know his work pretty well. And you might well remember um, this film, Summer in Monica, Summer with Monica, um, again from the early 1950s. When I'm teaching um, this Sturkstor film, I often show them a clip or even the whole film, Summer with Monica, because it's from just a few years later, five years later. And in much the same way, it, it captures uh, industrial Stockholm, poetic Stockholm, with a series of shots um, that often seem to be almost still photographs. So you get a, a montage of, of the city capturing as it was around 1950. Um, as Robert was saying, this, this is a city that is, is about to burst forth into the, the future. It's, it's about to modernise, but it's still a city that's full of, full of tenements, full of cramped little houses and, and, and poverty and smoky little cafes. Um, and of course, the, the docks and the trains and, and all of that. Um, so again, as, as a kind of um, uh, juxtaposition, um, have a look at Summer with Monica. Um, but I may come back to Monica uh, at the end as well. Um, now, people always ask me, what, what kind of films are these? It's, it's really difficult for us to, to make sense of them today. And probably the, the nearest parallel is um, the YouTube instructional film, um, maybe even TikTok films. I haven't started using TikTok yet, but some of you might have done. Um, there is a long tradition all the way through uh, film history of um, shorter films and films that are being used not so much to tell stories, but to persuade, to educate, to enlighten, um, and really to, to create citizens um, to, to, to train them to believe various things, to behave in, in various ways. Um, and this kind of cinema is called all sorts of different things. So I think this is what makes it quite hard often to explain to people what it is that I do. Uh, in the middle there, we've got the rather strange term useful cinema, which was coined by Charles Ackland and, and Heidi Wasson in a, a book of, of that name. Um, and some people would argue that this term useful cinema is actually not very useful because it, uh, it just um, creates a great big pot to throw everything into that isn't fiction film. 
Um, so that's both helpful and not helpful. But in the Scandinavian context, um, there's a really strong tradition of this kind of filmmaking. Denmark in particular, um, along with the British, um, led the world from the 1940s onwards in informational filmmaking. Um, and the Swedes um, were, were also acknowledged to be rather good at it. Um, and so it's quite enlightening to just take a little troll through the kinds of vocabulary uh, that was used. Um, again, mid-century, so 1930s to 1960s, to describe this kind of filmmaking in the Scandinavian languages. Um, something that's very hard to translate is op the film, that's the Danish, but the word in Swedish is, is very similar, isn't it? So enlightening film, which just sounds strange in English. But it's an important term because it expresses the idea that educational film is not just for school children. Educational film was actually a, a lifelong privilege um, and duty, actually, um, for people to continue to enlighten themselves and for the government to enlighten people. And that could be um, about such things as, as traffic safety or new laws, but it could also be about national heritage, sculpture or, or architecture or history. Um, in Swedish, uh, we often see the term bestellningsfilm, um, literally ordered films or commissioned films. Um, this is also an important aspect of this kind of filmmaking. Generally, it's not done to make money. Um, it's done uh, to, to have some kind of effect, some kind of impact, and it's paid for by whichever organisation wants to have that impact. So in English, we'll often call them commissioned films, and they can be commissioned by government ministries or charities or um, businesses, um, uh, workers' associations, um, any organisation with some money and purpose uh, would have uh, its, its share of filmmaking activity in these decades. Um, there's also a Scandinavian word, bogsfilm, um, so um, utility film, I suppose, it's very close to, to useful cinema. Uh, Kulturfilm, which comes from the German context uh, and which was adopted by the Danes, but I don't think we see that so much in Sweden. But that's self-explanatory, isn't it? These are films about culture, all aspects of culture, whether that's high art or, or society. Um, and the word for film uh, is important, uh, also a Scandinavian word which we can't really translate into English, but it just means the, the short films that were shown in cinemas before the main feature. So a lot of these films are made um, to be shown in, in clubs or schools or whatever, but a lot of them are made with really quite high production values because they have to be persuasive to people who are out on a date in the back row of the cinema on a Saturday night. If you're about to watch a romantic film full of stars um, and somebody's trying to persuade you to do your recycling, then that recycling film has to be funny. It has to have good music, you know? So these things um, often borrow, borrowed in quite witty ways from, from Hollywood genres, precisely because they have to persuade people of things. Now, I've tended to adopt the term informational cinema, which is which I didn't make up. Um, I found it in the brochures of the Edinburgh Film Festival from around this time. But I don't think we use it so much today, and, and so it's not really weighted with assumptions um, about what the films are for or how they're made. So I will be using that term um, sort of interchangeably. But this is to give you a sense of how there's a there's a lot of vocabulary here. And so um, this just shows how important this kind of filmmaking was in Scandinavian culture. Um, there is also, for anybody who's interested, a very strong British context and I'm sure most people will have heard of um, the classic film Night Mill there on, on the top right and of course um, you'll have heard of, of John Grierson um, and there are all kinds of classic Grierson quotes about what such filmmaking is supposed to do but I like this one the documentary idea demands no more than that the affairs of our time shall be brought to the screen in a fashion which strikes the imagination and makes observation a little richer than it was at one level, the vision may be journalistic. At another, it may rise to poetry and drama. At another level, again, its aesthetic quality may lie in the mere lucidity of its expression. And I quote Grierson here, um, not just because he, he's my countryman, but um, because he, he and his colleagues in the British documentary movement had such a, an immeasurable influence on filmmakers in, in Scandinavia. 
um, they loaned cameras from each other, they visited each other, they uh, they met each other at, at festivals. And um, certain Swedish institutions of, of the time, uh, here we have the, the Ministry of Social Affairs, um, uh, their committee on, uh, on social enlightenment, uh, which um, was, was behind um, a lot of films commissioned by the Swedish government in the 1940s and into the 1950s, was heavily influenced by, by John Grierson um, and, his, and his ideas. Um, so lots of traffic of ideas and films and people across the North Sea. Um, and in the 20s and, and 30s, actually, this debate had been going on. It didn't spring out of nothing. Um, and the, the Swedes were um, real pioneers. Um, you might remember from the previous talk uh, that 1919 is the year when Svensk Film und Industry, the, the dominant film company, was was established and only two years later it established a so-called um, school film department, so a department for making educational films. Um, other bodies in Sweden that were involved in commissioning and funding and producing this kind of film included um, the wonderfully named Filmo, which was Folk Rörelsen's Film Organisation, excuse my pronunciation, but the, the popular movement's um, uh, film film organisation, um, and then we have more commercial bodies such as Kino Centralen um, and um, Svensk Skolfilm or Bildningsfilm was uh, one of the, the publications of these organisations. Um, and you may not be able to see it, but on, on the front page there, on the top right column, there is a headline Oscar to uh, awarded to a film made by SF, and that of course was Arno Suchstorff's um, rhythm of, of a city. So all, all of this is, is really quite entangled, but I hope to um, establish uh, just how important this, this culture actually was. Now, Sweden's really interesting in this respect, and I'm still trying to get to grips with um, the Swedish context. In Denmark, uh, there, there were two um, state-run institutions, one called Dansk Kulturfilm and the other one called Stettens Filmcentral, so the State Film Centre which produced and um, distributed educational films um, in Denmark as well as abroad. And in Norway, um, you can see the S there, uh, there's also uh, an organisation called Stettens Film Central, which was established in, in 1948. So just when this post-war filmmaking is, is taking off. It's really important to realise that um, these films circulated not just nationally, not just in Scandinavia, but all, all over the world. So a lot of them were made uh, in, in English and, and many other languages as well, with the specific purpose of, of reaching people who might want to visit Stockholm, for example. But they also have much more um, workaday purposes, like public health. I thought I would throw this in here because this is very much on everyone's mind. Um, and uh, tuberculosis was a particularly important context um, for, for filmmaking. So here we have a a Danish one and an Norwegian one from the 1950s. You could see the, the use of, um, of graphics, of statistics, um, but it's also trying to be quite rhythmic and, and jolly. Now, um, one of my favourite Swedish films in this context is called uh, Medan de Enu Ertil, While There's Still Time, um, by Martin Surya in 1952, uh, just in, in the period where Sweden was leading the world in, in getting to grips with tuberculosis. And I have a few images here from this film for two reasons. It connects back to my uh, Phantom Courage talk, because this particular film actually adapted Selma Lagerlöf's Nils Holgersson, um, or one of the stories in it of uh, Osa, the goose girl, and her little brother, who go for uh, a wander through Sweden in search of their, their parents, and, and they get educated about the dangers of, of tuberculosis. Um, and that's one aspect of, of this 1952 film. The other really strange aspect of it is that it takes footage from Rhythm of a City, the film that we started off by watching, um, and the, the bottom right hand image there is, is just clipped out of Rhythm of a City and clipped into this anti-tuberculosis film. Um, and I, the only explanation I have for this is that there was actually a policy in many studios that if usable footage already existed, it wouldn't be reshot because that would be a waste of time 
and money. You would just recycle uh, any any footage um, that that seemed to be useful. Um, so that has the interesting effect of the same kinds of images coming up time and time again. And if we're thinking about the representation of Stockholm in particular, actually, it's not just about the same motifs and the same kind of figures and narratives being reused. The same stock, <laughs> the same film stock, the same footage is often being reused and building up and building up into this imaginative vocabulary of how Stockholm looks and, and how people move through the city and, and interact with it. Um, there's there's a clearer comparison of of the two. So I'm quite interested in this idea that Stockholm, of course, is 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 a lived space. It's a space that people experience on, on multi sensory levels, but it's also a, an, an imaginative space. Um, people know where they live because they have seen it on on the, the cinema screens too. Um, so a couple of uh, images here just to emphasise how, how mobile this kind of cinema was. Um, these films, including Stuxdorf's film, Stockholm, the other films that we'll be talking about relating to Stockholm, would have travelled the world and they would have been seen not just in cinemas, but um, from mobile screening vans in all kinds of places. Um, in trade fairs and, and cultural fairs and you know national uh, exhibitions which were held every few years and the kind of equipment that was used um, looked like this um, there were frequent innovations in uh, ever more portable projectors um, ever more portable screens um, promising high fidelity and fitting into a suitcase Now, there's, there's another um, dimension to all of this, uh, which brings us into our own time, which is that these, this, this vast body of films, you know, most of the films ever made have been not feature films, but have been industrial films, educational films, amateur films. And these are now proliferating online um, for a few reasons. Firstly, because it's incredibly easy and cheap to digitise and um, make available online films where we might not know who the director was, we might not know who the rights holders were. And so we are starting to see sites like um, filmarchive.se, which I highly recommend. You can see all of the films that I'm mentioning tonight on here. But you can see as well on the front page that it's organised geographically. So you can click on um, uh, your, your favourite city or, or village um, and find the, the film footage that relates to it. And actually, the Swedes um, copied the Danes here. The Danes were the first to put together a, um, a, a national map of Denmark um, and embed and geotag film footage. But we would often call this kind of filmmaking um, orphan films, which is a little bit sad. It just means we don't know who the rights holders are. Um, of course, there's lots of amateur film there as well. And I don't have time to talk about this, but um, there's a strong tradition in Sweden of um, film workshops. Um, so including uh, immigrants to Sweden in this post-war period often found a sense of community and were able to express themselves through um, state-funded filmmaking workshops. And this book by Lars Gustaf Andersson and John Sundholm um, is, is a really interesting dive into that kind of activity. Um, so more and more of this is, is now available um, digitally. And I will also just mention a couple of books which you can download for free, um, I, as long as you read Swedish. Uh, one of them on the Swedish filmmaker Justa Werner, who worked for, for many different companies making educational films. Um, and uh, another one about um, city films in Gothenburg, which is not the city we're focusing on tonight, um, but it has a very rich tradition of, of filmmaking um, about the city and promoting the city. And these are available to download from Media Historics Archive um, for free, which is wonderful. So I want to then um, kind of come back to Arne Suxdorf's City Symphony and consider it as part of a, a, a chain of influence, if you like, which stretches far beyond Sweden. Um, under the rubric of this, this genre, the, the city symphony. And this genre stretches back to the 1920s. Uh, you may well be familiar with um, the film Berlin 
um, Symphony of a Great City by Walter Ruttmann, um, dating from the, the late 1920s. Um, and there were a few other such city symphonies uh, in the 1920s. By the time we get to the post-war era and Arne Stuxdorf is being asked to, to make his film about Stockholm, this is actually quite a well-defined genre. Um, to the extent that John Grierson, um, our Scottish film theorist, had some very strong opinions about it. He thought that um, city symphonies um, romanticised the, the plight of the, the everyday worker because the, the hard labour of the people who work on the trains or um, on building sites was, was being um, abstracted, uh, it was being reduced to, to rhythm and to music and so on. So John Grierson thought that the City Symphony was a profoundly unprogressive kind of filmmaking, but it didn't put people off. Um, this was uh, uh, an extremely popular uh, subject for filmmakers and um, cities threw money at this and of course um, tourist authorities threw money at this kind of, of filmmaking both as educational films so just telling people about um, these cities but also trying to attract tourists. Now there's a little um, flurry of um, post-war city focused filmmaking which makes sense these capital cities that are coming out of the second world war trying to re-establish themselves uh, in an international um, collaboration of some kind. And Arne Suxdorf's film was very influential in this respect. Um, it was almost contemporaneous with uh, a film called Waverly Steps, um, which I've brought in here partly because it's quite important, partly because I know we have a few uh, Edinburgh people here. And it looks very much like Arne Suxdorf's Rhythm of, of a City, um, even though it came a year after. Now, Interestingly, when a few years later, the city of Copenhagen decided that it wanted a new film about Copenhagen, um, they asked, guess who, Arne Suxdorf, to make that film? And he said no, because uh, he, he didn't want to make it in black and white. He, he'd won an Oscar. He didn't want to do low budget filmmaking for the Danes. Why, why would he? But Rhythm of a City and Waverly Steps and Berlin Symphony of a City were the three films that were shown to an emerging young Danish filmmaker by the name of Jörn Hoes, who was eventually commissioned to make the film that would become a city called Copenhagen. Um, now, Arno Suxdorf then kicked himself because Jörn Hoes was so charming that he managed to double the budget of the film and have it filmed in, in colour. So Arno Suxdorf could have had his wonderful big budget colour film about Copenhagen, but he missed his chance. And A City Called Copenhagen um, was nominated for an Oscar as well in the, the same short film category. Now you can you can also watch that one online and it's, it's witty, it's wonderful. It just captures that moment in Copenhagen when jazz is all over the place and people in flouncy skirts are dancing on the pavements and the welfare state is, is really taking shape. And most of all, um, Scandinavia's first skyscraper uh, is going up, as you can see from that architect's model in the middle. Now, Jörn Wos's success at the Oscars in the early 1960s then kicked off a new fashion, which became the what we might call the, the modern or even, even the postmodern or the self-referential city symphony. You couldn't make a straightforward city symphony that took itself seriously, like Arno Suxdorf's. But what you could do was you could try to somehow subvert the genre and, and make reference to it. So there's a point in a city called Copenhagen where there's a flurry of trumpets and the glamorous sponsor of the Copenhagen Harbour Authority is announced and splashed um, across the screen. Um, Jörn Rost became so popular that he was invited to make city films for I think eight other cities worldwide and he uh, accepted commissions for Hamburg and Oslo, which are both um, poetic to the point of being pretentious, I might almost say. They're, they're, they're charming, they're beautiful. Um, they have a background of experimental jazz and some pretty crazy ideas about how time and space coalesces in, in, in the city. Um, but, I'll gloss over my city called Copenhagen slides. But I just want to mention two things 
Um, one is that the film that was on the, the kind of the advertising um, event card, Secret Stockholm, is a bit of a mystery to me. I haven't been able to find much information on its origins, but it, it very much falls into this category of the early 1960s um, pretentious <laughs> city symphony or poetic city symphony. And these um, seem to have been quite an important phenomenon in, in Scandinavia. Uh, the, the tourist offices, for example, the, the Oslo tourist office uh, held a competition uh, and invited several filmmakers to um, to make proposals for what a, a modern film about Oslo would, would look like. Um, and the, the competition itself became um, a bit of a, a phenomenon um, advertising the, the city both nationally and internationally. So you can see how the, the city symphony at this time is, is becoming a almost a kind of ironic um, phenomenon, but no less effective for that. Um, Secret Stockholm was, was based on a book by its director Edward Mays and, and Bror Carlson. If anybody knows anything about him, I would love to, to hear it. Um, but it, it does fall into this, this very Scandinavian tradition of the early 1960s. The other thing I would say, and this is picking up on, on Robert's um, introduction as well, is that we can point to this wave of city symphonies mapping out the immediate post-war city in the late 1940s, which makes a lot of sense. And then if we if we zoom forward by a decade, um, Scandinavian cities, of course, are changing radically, dramatically. You can see that in, in Stockholm as well. Um, and skyscrapers are, are going up, um, modern conveniences are, are, are being installed. Um, but we have this, this wonderful juxtaposition of um, the, the older traditions down on the street, like this you know, cart with the banana seller here, um, and, and the much more modern expressions of, of Scandinavian progressiveness and modernity. Why does, this, uh, why does this image look so pink? Well, um, this is the little punchline to Arne Suxdorf's fateful decision not to make the Copenhagen film. And that is that um, the, the incredibly expensive colour film stock that was used and paid for was Eastman colour, which was all the rage at the time. Um, it gave you such very subtle colours, but it faded after about 25 years. Every film made on that generation of Eastman colour went pink because the, the other colour layers, blue and yellow, faded much faster, except for the bananas, they kept their, their yellow. So it actually wasn't until um, round about the turn of the millennium when it became possible to digitise this kind of film heritage that it was possible then to, um, to redo the colours, to rebalance the colours. So any, uh, any Eastman colour film that you see from, from that time will, will probably have had its, its colour adjusted. So I just love this idea that the, um, the, the mid-century film heritage is either black and white, in which case it has lasted pretty well, or it's, it's, it's trying to express its modernity in, in colour, um, and that slowly deteriorates and, and fades. So Secret Stockholm I would recommend, but it's a very slow contemplative film looking at the city from, from some unexpected angles. Um, the really interesting one, I think, and I've called this final section of the talk um, Swedish modern, I suppose, echoing the kind of furniture that we also see uh, in many of these films. The really interesting one is the riddle of Sweden um, from 1963. And this was directed by Justa Werner, who we see on the, the left there. It was commissioned and funded by Sveriges Almena Exportförening. So another example of um, a very workaday organisation. This was the Export Association of Sweden. And its purpose was that it would, the film would be sent off around the world and used by the International Network of Offices of the Export Association as part of their portfolio of um, uh, promotional materials. So they would have posters and brochures uh, Several books by that time had been written um, about about Sweden um, and distributed internationally, primarily in, in English. There were five language versions of, of this film. Um, 
And what I think is really interesting is that even though it's made for the Export Association, there are no particular products in it. Sweden itself is the product. Sweden is, is the brand. Um, and Sweden's branding itself as progressive, internationalist, democratic, modern. Um, and so this is a, a state-driven nation branding exercise. Um, now we, we can, if you like, look, look at a clip of this, or you might want to watch it in, in your own time. But essentially the film starts with, with a huge aeroplane landing, having flown above Swedish mountains. Um, and then it takes us round um, Swedish schools, Swedish hospitals, Swedish architecture, everything incredibly modern, but contrasts it with the institution of the monarchy um, and the um, ornamental soldiers parading in, in the streets and so on. And who's being addressed, of course, it's an American who can't work out why this charming little country, this socialist country, should also be so modern and rich and successful. Um, so it very much captures uh, its, its time. Um, but I just want to suggest, uh, last of all, that this kind of nation branding work, so this kind of filmmaking, which is, has passed its golden age by, by 1960, um, it's actually also serving a purpose, which is to counteract the other aspect of, of Swedish nation branding, um, which was, was being done not deliberately, um, not in a state-sponsored way, but by filmmakers like Ingmar Bergman um, and later on um, the um, uh, I, am, I Am Curious films and, and so on, that uh, Sweden is a country full of, full of sex and sin and glamorous young flippity gibbets frolicking naked in, in the sands. Um, when I was uh, in France a couple of years ago, I picked up this book second hand. In fact, I've got an image there on the slide. Le Nouveau Cinema Scandinave. It dates from 1968. And I think the cover here just kind of summarises um, where uh, the reputation of Sweden was towards the end of, of that decade. So it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating, I think, that we have these two counter narratives. Um, the state trying to educate its citizens, trying to educate the rest of the world about what Stockholm and what Sweden really is. And on the other hand, we've we've got um, the the much more organic, accidental impact of of cinema creating quite a different set of, of beliefs um, about the secrets of Stockholm. So I shall I shall stop there. But as I say, I would be really glad to hear about anybody's memories of this kind of, of filmmaking or um, anything at all that you would like to discuss. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I was quite curious uh, to know, uh, first of all, what you could tell us about Thormen and Medmonica, and also what you could <laughs> tell us about the Quatre Sans Coup, uh, two very different films. Uh, the Quatre Sans Coup happens to be one of my favourite films, ah. but um, how does it fit in with uh, Swedish short films? <laughs> well, um, the Quatre Sans Coup has, has a very short sequence where um, Antoine and his friend go into a cinema and they, they want to do something naughty. So they steal a poster of Monica in the summer with Monica from the wall and stick it inside their, their jacket. And this was um, this was Truffaut's little uh, nudge, I suppose, saying. Well, Truffaut, and I, I think it was Godard actually thought that Summer with Monica was one of the finest films ever made. Um, and so we can say that somewhere with Monica kind of underpinned a lot of the, the ideas of, of the French New Wave. Um, but at the same time, Summer with Monica was circulating in, in the US, uh, intercut with images from a nudist holiday camp. So it, it was loved by the French New Wave, but also by pornographers in, in the US. And it doesn't really have anything to do with um, the short films of, of the time. It's just that it, uh, for me, it's emblematic of, of these two different dynamics uh, of, of how cinema is presenting Sweden to the world. Two very sad films, actually, for very different yeah. reasons. Oh, the other thing I would say about that, actually, um, coming full circle is, of course, that Summer with Monica has this wonderful um, imagery of, of Stockholm, anno 1952, um, as a, as a the, the same Stockholm that, that Sugstorf was, was recording. And you can also see that in Summer with Monica, 
Stockholm is just on the verge of modernity. You know, people are moving out of the, the tenements. Streets are filling with, with cars. Um, but it's not, it's not quite there yet. It's like a little, little fossilised version of Stockholm. So, are you happy to answer questions? If, if I can. <laughs> All right. So, questions. Um, Alexandra, do you want to do this? Because you, I've, I'm using a tiny screen. You've got an enormous screen. And you can see people much better. So, uh, can you... Uh, I'm happy to do that. Th and thank you very much, um, Claire. Um, so, who would like to kick off? Ah, uh, David. David Goldsmith. Professor yeah. Goldsmith. Yeah, uh, Claire, that was wonderful. It's very interesting. Uh, as as with your previous talk, um, very thought provoking. Um, propaganda. I actually noticed the word there. Some const oc propaganda on the uh, your Stavena film, as opposed to reportage, as opposed to something more artistic and creative. I mean, it's a constant challenge, isn't it? Depending, I guess, who's commissioned the film, who you think is going to be the audience for the film, and I suppose the extent to which you've got your own personal agenda, as many film directors would have had, in, ter in terms of what you're going to portray. I think it's particularly interesting in with Sweden, because Sweden has many faces. The face that we see when we look in, especially like myself, those who are not Swedish, and the face that Sweden has when it's at home, as it were, and the two contrasts you put there beautifully, I think, show exactly the difference and the gulf between the two. But in the end, um, is there a sort of, is there a way to, would these different films fall so neatly into my categorizations of propaganda or um, creativity, or are they actually much more blended and I, sh I shouldn't look to try and pigeonhole them in that way? I, I think that they, they do tend to be blended in the sense that filmmakers work across the different genres. They, you know, they learn mm. their skills on the, the educational films and then they aspire to get into feature yeah. filmmaking. But as is well known, Ingmar Bergman made soap commercials, you know, so, so there's a lot of back and forth between these two different worlds. There's, um, there was probably a lot of overlap in terms of how people actually consumed the films because you, you would always, as I said, have some kind of educational film and or newsreel before the main feature so it's it's all part of the same consumption context and um, the word propaganda i'm really glad you brought that up um i didn't put it on my slide with all of the the names for this kind of filmmaking but in the scandinavian languages it was quite common to use the word propaganda even as a verb at propaganda for uh well up into the 1960s um and some friends of mine uh have done um actually sort of big data analysis where, where they uh, digitize lots and lots of, of newspapers and, and reports and you can see that the use of the word propaganda disappears in the mid 70s but these films are often called propaganda film and that's really confusing for us because we can't separate out the notion of propaganda from something that's you know evil and, and political but actually they, they just wanted to propagandize for um danish cheese or <laughs> for holidays in stockholm and, and it was very very common to to use that word in a very innocent way even post thank you very much war, enough. um ridian ridian jones would like to say ask a question uh thank you very much for that uh, claire that's fascinating uh one of my hobbies is collecting old um propaganda uh, about Scandinavia and, and both from the travel viewpoint and from the government viewpoint. And there's a marvelous book called Sweden in the 60s, which was put out by the Swedish Institute, which, which is, if you like, a series of stills making the same points as, as these films. The fascination for me is that the, the way the Swedes rode two horses, uh, and indeed in one of the films, which I watched yesterday, um, it, it suggested that um, maybe the modern wasn't such a good thing after all. You know, there was this kind of throwaway line at the end saying, well, we've, we've, shown, you, we've shown you the history and we've shown you the up-to-date bit, but maybe not everything is right. And, you raise the point that there, there, there's a societal element in all of this, and, and uh, 
the culture change is that Swedes, Swedes really tried very hard to be modern without giving up their mm -hmm. traditions. And uh, is, that, is that a conclusion that you would share? Um, I think I think it's important. Um, somebody somebody mentioned this earlier to to think through how national stereotypes are created. They're created both from within, from from shared beliefs, from everyday observations, but they're also created because of what we think other nations think about us. So you can actually in this kind of filmmaking the films that are um, produced specifically for a foreign audience like the riddle of sweden if you read them really closely you can see that tension you can see that they are they're projecting outwards they're exaggerating the modernity because they think that's what people need to know they think that's what people think um and yet entangling it with 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 the forests and the mountains and the, the handicrafts and so on um it's 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 an artificial exercise because the you know the, the these films are being made for very particular purposes and with very particular agendas but you can still see um the misunderstandings or the ways in which um particular agendas can be there in screenplay if you look at the written script but which don't make it to the screen because it might be something that just can't be filmed or can't be expressed in in image and, and sound. So those those tensions, I think, are, are always embedded in, in the films themselves. I mean, it would be possible, wouldn't it, to, to have constructed in the 1960s a, a film which was solely based on, um, on the modern, if you like. Mm. But yeah. these are very clearly riding both horses, aren't they? Yeah, they're they're constructing the modern as, as something that is that is new, that is the future, that is that is changing. Um, there's a line in a city called Copenhagen, the, the Danish film, where the the voiceover says, "But the future is already here." Uh, and he's standing in in a in a slum, really, but the camera's looking up at this this skyscraper that's that's being constructed. So yeah, so a strong sense of history, I suppose, a strong sense of being in a transitional period and that Scandinavia is both a place but it's also a time. Scandinavia is the future or wants to be. Thank you. That, 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 that's what really gripped me about these was that um, that it was, I mean to Swedes, the modern is, is particularly relevant or was particularly relevant in the 1960s because many of them had lived very poor lives mm. in the 1930s. So, you know, within within one lifespan, the change had taken place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I guess they've, they've got to tell that story to themselves um, as well as the world. But Ridian, you also said something interesting about the way in which um, these films, of course, don't operate uh, in isolation. They also operate with, um, with, with, with books, with magazines, with brochures published by the Swedish Institute and, and other organizations like that. So they're, they're part of a multimedia uh, construction of, of what Sweden is. Thank you, Rydia. Um, anyone else want to uh, ask a question at this time? I was struck by how old fashioned uh, Sweden looked or Stockholm looked in, in, 19, in the 1960s, also looking at some of the movies that, that you've linked to previously, um, which is almost a surprise given um, those of us who maybe looked at old catalogues and propaganda from the Stockholm Ex Expo from 1930, mm -hmm. um, one might have imagined that things had got further down that um, line by 19, the early 60s, but, it, but it's a whole generation that. Um, and um, my, my earliest memories were in the early 70s, where when um, there was a phenomenon called Riksgruppen. Maud will remember all of these um, things. Um, Riksgruppen, uh, which, which was when they really just knocked the stuffing out of the center of uh, north center of Stockholm. And, um, and it was extremely fascinating to see because um, there were huge pits of 
great cellars and, and they were tearing out all the old and, and putting down the enormous new stuff that was a, a very fascinating to, to a five-year-old, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so I think it's, it's very, it's interesting. It's not really a question. It's just an observation that, that the ambition was there but it took until the 70s, really, to, to, to realise it. And um... it, it puts me in mind of uh, another film that is difficult to get hold of, but is worth seeing if you can, and, and that's Flick or Not, or The Girls, by Mai Zetterling, uh, the, the woman director. And this is from, I think, 68 as well. And um, anecdotally, she, she, she takes these um, actors on, on a tour around Sweden, and they visit, I think, the first shopping centre. And that was something that just stuck in my mind. You know, Sweden's first modern shopping centre uh, is in this film here in 68. As you say, it feels a bit, feels a bit late. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, Mike has his hand up, I think. Yeah, thank, thank you, um, Claire. That was wonderful. Um, I, my history, I'm English, obviously, but I've had a Swedish pen friend since the mid 50s. <laughs> Uh, in Trollhättan, and we're still in touch. And um, so, and I'm a town planner. So I did my thesis in Trollhättan in '58, and it was very interesting watching the changes. And I was interested to see anything in film or in print. And I used the Swedish Institute, obviously. Uh, although I was up in Newcastle, but I used to come down to London to to get any information I could. And it was really interesting seeing my pen friends sort of parallel feelings, you know, everything Swedish modern was what counted. Mm -hmm. And as young people, we were just so excited about all this. And, and I think it was interesting to see how that carried through. And we almost lost the sort of traditional stuff that we've now come back to and, and which was obviously going on in the background. But we were all really just excited in the 60s before it went a bit crazy, as, as Alexander said, in the 70s and mm -hmm. subsequently, I think, and uh, knew it wasn't quite as good as it would appear to be. I should just perhaps add that my, my Swedish pen friend, subsequently, who was an engineer, uh, subsequently went on with uh, Jan Löv, who you may know as a writer, to produce Skrotnissa, or sweet on Swedish television, which is a sort of a cartoon film that's pretty popular. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've seen him sort of get involved in and interested in, in and obviously Trollhättan has been Trollywood and Bollywood mm -hmm. and so on, has been quite a sort of centre of film activity. So it's been really interesting watching all this develop in my lifetime. Absolutely. So thank you very much. That was terrific what you, you've said. Can, can I recommend that you um, you watch A City Called Copenhagen, which you can just Google and find online um, because it's got quite a strong town planning theme. Yeah, I'm sure. You, you might enjoy it. I'm sure. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Um, Sarah, Sarah Death. Unmute. Yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, hello, Claire. Can I ask, uh, I hope you won't think this is a slightly frivolous question and I can explain why I'm asking it afterwards, but you, you mentioned cheese. Um, were there any films uh, about healthy eating and specifically, and I'm, my mind was jogged by seeing the magenta colored banana cart, anything about the, the health benefits of eating bananas? <laughs> I don't remember any films specifically about bananas um, no because you you talked about the way everything was linked you know um magazines and, and films and so on and i mean we're going back slightly earlier here but um ellen wegner's sval on earth luga hooked which i have in a falling apart second-hand edition here that's from 1929 i think mm -hmm. but uh, it's got an absolutely heart-rending episode in it in which a young man who, who's basically psychologically damaged and dying inside is forced to dress up as a human-sized banana <laughs> and go around the villages of small land trying to give away free bananas and, and, and convince everyone of the health benefits. And I've also seen advertisements of the time from, from Banan Compagnie and, and Fife's and, and various other banana companies 
And I just wondered if this had later on transmitted it into film. So, so Bananas must have been having a, a moment. A moment, I yes. And I wondered if that had, had continued yeah. in, into the film era. I don't I don't remember anything specific. I mean it's not it's not impossible that mm. some um import company uh would 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 deal with something like that. Yeah. Um there are films about beer and how good it is and you know Carlsberg um, mm. donating all sorts to the nation. There are films about um about processes, loads of processes, about how cheese is made, how how a cooperative dairy works, um yeah. how you grow turnips. Uh huh. <laughs> but I've, I've never seen anything about bananas. But I will look. Yeah, I was, I'd interesting be interested to hear if if you find anything. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> you know, I, I I love all of these obscure <laughs> challenges. Find me a film about bananas. <laughs> um, I'm sure I saw somebody else put a hand up. Maybe maybe, maybe it was about about bananas and, and the questions already been answered. I um. I seem to remember, um, did, did you ever see a, um, films by um, Rolf Blombay? I don't think so. No, Amazonas. He, he was quite famous in the, um, he was a travel uh, filmmaker okay. uh, in the 50s and 60s uh, in Sweden. And there were bananas, I do remember. I will introduce you to these excellent films. Well, I, I just invested in a, in a box set of, of Arna. Arna Sukhstorf's um, films and, and a lot of them of course are him all over the world um, he's wrestling a snake here in the cover so I would imagine there'll be all kinds of um, it's, of it's, uh, he worked with a, um, a filmmaker called uh, Torgny Anderberg did you hear of him at all? No, no but I shall look these up well I will introduce you mm. posthumously, I will, uh, posthumously. Um, that was fabulous Thank you, and, and thank you everyone. Does anyone want to say anything before I um, um, ha hand over to uh, David um, Goldsmith who will announce the next uh, online one, but, but just really to, to, to reiterate Robert's thanks. Um, and uh, we're very glad to have you as part of the Anglo-Swedish Society. Um, we're very uh, pleased that next time we can not even jump the gun and call you professor. <laughs> you can just call me Claire. <laughs> well, we'll do that too, <laughs> Professor Claire. And, um, and and thank you, Robert, um, for 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 everything you do to 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 make these um, excellent talks happen. Um, just to say, can I add my thanks again? Thank you very much, Claire. I know you go to enormous trouble uh, when you talk to us, and we really do appreciate it. And thank you, and again. Many, many congratulations. I think that's fantastic news. Uh, I, we are just so delighted for you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's not often that I get the chance to rabbit on for 45 minutes about you know, my favourite subjects. So it's, it's quite a treat. And can, can I just say, um, I would urge everybody to make the most of uh, filmarchivet.se because there's some really wonderful stuff on there, freely available. Um, so have a look. So, um, David, who is uh, hosting our, our next Zoom event, and we will have live events before you know it, but, um, but this has been a very well planned and uh, will be anticipated. Um, I, I know several of, of those of, uh, of us here this evening have, have already signed up, but put the word around because it will be another nice, um, excellent thing. Over to David. Yes, thanks, Alexander. Um, on the 6th of October, uh, starting at our usual time, 7 o'clock, we're going to have a talk from Uppsala by Professor Neil Price of Uppsala University. He's the Professor of Archaeology, and he's, uh, I think, really, if you look around the world, the, the doyen of the, the, of the sort of early modern historical ar archaeology of, of Sweden. He's worked all around the world, but he knows a great deal about the, the Viking, Viking era. And he's written a beautiful book um, called Children of Ash and Elm, A History of the Vikings. And I, I must say, I've learned a huge amount just by reading that book. And it's quite startlingly different from many of the other accounts and things that you read. So I've asked him to talk to us um, on, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's so macabre. 
um, dealing with the dead in the Viking Age. But there is a very interesting, um, there's very interesting information about what happened when people died, funerary rituals and practices in Viking times. And it really sheds light on the relationship between life and death, because we have a feeling of what life and death are. But I think in those times, people didn't just disappear when their body stopped working. And um, the Vikings had a particular way of, of thinking about these aspects in terms of their ancestors and how important they were in integrating them into their modern lives. So Neil will take us through a little bit about that because he's done some particular research in various parts of Sweden and indeed Scandinavia, looking at the, the graves and, and the sort of artifacts that go therein. So um, I think it'll be, uh, I hope it'll be a really good talk and I really encourage you to, to come and as uh, Alexander said, to spread the word so that we get a good audience for that. Uh, and there we are. Um, thank you everyone. Um, I will leave the channel open in, in case anyone wants to chit chat, but I think that's, that, that brings the end of the, uh, the evening um, as far as the formal part goes. Um, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all in person and in other ways soon. Thank you again. Thanks very much. Good night. Thanks very much. Good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers.